שלום לכולם, אנחנו נתחיל. Hello everyone, I'm happy to present Yoav Vaknin. Yoav is a graduate of the Revivim Excellence Program at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He has a bachelor degree in mathematics and Jewish studies and a master degree in Bible studies. And Yoav is currently in his final stages of submitting his PhD at the Tel Aviv University. Is that correct also? His supervisors are Professor Oded Lifshitz, Professor Erez Ben Yosef from the Department of Archaeology at the Tel Aviv University, and Professor Ron Shah from the Palo Magnetic Laboratory at the Department of Earth Sciences, and I'm saying it correctly, in the Hebrew University. In the framework of his PhD, Yoav conducted a research project in uh, archaeomagnetism, which includes sampling and many archaeological sites. Some of his results were recently published in PNAS on the reconstruction of biblical uh, military campaigns using geomagnetic field data. So thank you, Rav, for being our guest in the school seminar today. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I want to start with uh, some bad news. I'm sorry uh, for this, but uh, if there is no magnetic field, there's no life on Earth. This is, uh, you can see the Earth here, over here in the sun. Dangerous radiation coming from the sun uh, will not enable any life on Earth if there were not, if Earth wasn't protected by the magnetic field. Um, to make things even worse, you know, Mars used to have a magnetic field and doesn't anymore. So its magnetic field disappeared. You can see this uh, here in this paper in science, they tried to explain why it disappeared. That's still debated, but it's clear that it, there, it, there wasn't a magnetic field in Mars and there isn't anymore. And to make things even worse, then Earth's magnetic field is becoming weaker and weaker since people started measuring it directly about uh, 190 years ago. So this is even worse. And um, the thing is that we don't really know why the magnetic field of the Earth changes over time. And this is one of the five most important questions in modern physics. This is what Albert Einstein thought. So before all of you, uh, might, some, might have you some of you might have think, well, maybe you were in the wrong seminar. So don't worry, I'm going back to archaeology immediately. Um, so the thing is that the magnetic field of the Earth can help us better understand uh, destruction layers and military campaigns from the biblical times, but it works also in the other way around. This is, I think, unique, unique for archaeomagnetism because it's not only that we take this uh, scientific tool and use it to better understand archaeological questions, but it works the other way around, maybe even more, because there is no way that a geophysicist trying to understand the behavior of the magnetic field in the Holocene can, can reconstruct the magnetic field so accurately like we do on the time axis thanks to the very good archaeological dating, sometimes from historical sources or radiocarbon, et cetera. But our time resolution is very, very good. And this is very important for geophysicists trying to better understand the magnetic field of the Earth. So what I'll talk about today after the a brief in, introduction, the, my talk will be divided into three uh, different uh, parts. Experimental archaeology we did to better understand how archaeological materials record the magnetic field. Then site formation, better understanding the uh, uh, what we see in burnt materials, and, and better understanding when and how the magnetic uh, data was recorded. And the last part, which is the most important part, this is the focus of my PhD, which is archaeomagnetic dating. But the dating is based on the two other things. With, that's why uh, I'll talk about in this uh, uh, order. Then I'll talk briefly about future potential and summarize. And of course, there'll be a time for questions and comments from, from everybody here and the, the Zoom. So um, the geomagnetic vector, uh, the magnetic field of the Earth changes all the time. It's not, it's not the same. We have, um, we have also uh, uh, reversals. Maybe some of you have heard of reversals. That's a very famous example of Geshev Not Yaakov that was dated according to our reversal when the magnetic field just pointed it completely in the other direction. But in the periods that I'm dealing with, we had no reversals, but still the magnetic field changes all the time. As I said, it changes also nowadays. And uh, these changes are also in direction and also in intensity. When we're talking about the direction of the field, we measure it by two uh, angles. One is the declination, this angle here, between the uh, 
our vector, the, the direction of the magnetic field in a certain point on Earth, and the geographic north. The geographic north is the axis of the spinning of the Earth. That's more or less constant, but the, the magnetic north changes all the time. So the angle between these two are called declination and inclination, the angle between the magnetic vector and the horizon, because the magnetic field is not horizontal. It has a vertical component as well. In Israel, it's about 50 degrees down uh, usually. So um, that's the direction and the intensity here. The sizes of the arrows are different because the intensity in some places on the earth, the, uh, the magnetic field is stronger and other places it's weaker and it changes over time. So um, how do we know how the magnetic field behaved in the past? So as I said, today we have direct measurements, satellites measuring it and the intensity. Gauss invented the, the first magnet magnetometer to measure the intensity of the field and direction that the British ships recorded the magnetic field uh, direction for about 400 years. But before, if you want to know how the magnetic field behave, behave before that, since we're talking about a geological phenomenon, we, we need data from much earlier than that. Here we have indirect measurement. This is the field of Palo magnetism, reconstructing the magnetic field of the Earth in the past. The, now, the, maybe the best example is a lava flow. When basalt rocks uh, are formed, they record the magnetic field. But there are many other examples like sediments in the sea, etc. All these are geological materials, but I'll focus today on archaeological materials, what's called archaeomagnetism, reconstructing the magnetic field from archaeological materials. And I think archaeomagnetism is also, when you, you focus, you use this also to answer archaeological materials. So this is archaeomagnetism. And as I said, we have a great advantage because of the dating. So as, actually for the Holocene, this, this is much more efficient and, and useful than this. So how does this work? Um, very briefly, in Archaeological materials, we have what we call ferromagnetic minerals. These are minerals that have a, a small magnetic signal on, of their own. You can imagine, you can imagine these little uh, particles, they have like a needle of a compass that's a, a magnet in itself. So it, when it has the ability to move, it'll point to the magnetic field around it, the ambient field, the, the, the field of the earth. But, and unlike in the compass, the ability to move doesn't, is not mechanical, it depends on temperature. Once it's heated above a certain temperature, they can move and once it cools down, then it's stuck again and remains in the same direction. So if you take any, any mud from any archeological excavation, you might have these ferromagnetic minerals, but they'll be oriented this way. So one, one uh, the magnetic signal will be in this direction, one in that direction, and the total magnetic signal will be very uh, weak and not, uh, not uh, unified. But once you heat it up to a, above a certain temperature, they're all aligned with the magnetic field. And then when they cool down, they'll be aligned uh, this way. Of course, it doesn't have to be exactly like this, but statistically, they'll all point in the same direction. And then we can come thousands of years later and measure this magnetic field and know what that direction and what the intensity was. Now, in order to measure that direction, we need to sample them in the original position in which they cool down. As I explained, the Recording happens not when they are heated, but when they cool down. So if we sample something in the orientation in which it cooled down, then we can reconstruct the direction of the field of the, of the earth at, at that time. If we don't have that, we can only reconstruct the intensity. So if we look at this uh, ceramic uh, kiln, the, the walls of the kiln built of marble bricks uh, contain these ferromagnetic minerals and that can, then we can reconstruct both the direction and intensity. The ceramic vessels themselves, once they're removed, they're not in the orientation in which they cool down, and then we can't reconstruct the, uh, the intensity. Uh, we can't reconstruct the direction, but only the intensity. So um, I'll start with talking about the experimental archaeology, what we did. This is a paper that's now under review. When we try, we, we, we show how we can reconstruct the firing temperature and identify also fire with burnt materials. Uh, in clay uh, archaeological materials using uh, thermal demagnetization. Thermal demagnetization is when we in the lab erase, the, we measure the magnetic field and, and then we gradually erase it using uh, uh, heating it in an oven with a zero field environment. So how, how did that work? We started, we heated them, the, these, we took non-burnt mud bricks from Telesafi and we heated them to different temperatures. And you can see here the change in color, for example, in different temperatures. Um, we should really, uh, you can see the change from about 400 degrees. This is actually like what archaeologists usually do. They, they see these red uh, hard bricks and say that they were, were burnt, but actually also these were burnt. They're not red and they're not hot and they're not hard. And, 
but they but they were also burned just to lower temperatures. So this is a good tool in the field, of course, that the color can change from other uh, factors as well, like uh, oxygen and so on. So it's not it's not a, a, a perfect uh, tool, but it's useful, uh, especially in the field. And another thing that we did is we put just put them in water when we saw the disintegration in water. So these, you see, all just by putting them in water, they disintegrated for up to 400 degrees Celsius. And those that were heated to more than 400 uh, degrees Celsius didn't, didn't disintegrate. But again, this is only useful from a certain temperature and up. What do you do to, uh, uh, to understand the lower temperatures? Another commonly used uh, method is FTIR. This was published in, in 2007. And these are the results that are now in the same paper. I, I ran these samples from the same um, the same um, mud bricks I just showed before, the same samples, we took and we checked uh, the, the change in the FTIR spectra after every heating uh, uh, step of the, and we saw that from the unheated material and the material heated all the way up to 460 degrees, there was no change at all. And for 490 degrees, there's slight changes, but still you can see the these peaks over here and the main peak at 133 is still there. So it's not enough to say for sure that this was actually burnt in 490 degrees. 520 degrees, you already see the significant change and you see the change, the, the shift here in the, in the main peak, et cetera. So 500 degrees and up is clear, it is a clear cut that it was fired according to FTIR, but below 500 degrees, it's not, not always clear and it's, it's hard to tell if it was burnt, but it doesn't mean it wasn't burnt. It just was burnt, maybe it could have been burnt, but to lower temperatures. What we did is we uh, took these mud bricks, we crushed them and mixed them with water to, to like recycling bricks. And we, uh, we first, uh, um, we magnetized them in the, in the Apollo magnetic ovens, this time with a magnetic field, with an ambient magnetic field that we created. So we controlled how strong this field was and, the, and in different temperatures. So three of these were magnetized in, uh, 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 in 100 degrees Celsius, three of them in 130 and so on, all the way up to 700 degrees Celsius. And we checked how, how this influenced. And immediately, all, even those uh, that were heated only to 100 degrees, we completely changed their magnetic signal pointing to, to the magnetic signal that we created here in the oven. And then we gradually erased this magnetic field. How did we do that? We heated them again in the same oven, but this time with a zero field environment. 100 degrees and we measured the magnetic signal and 130 and measured and again all the way up to 700 degrees this we did to all of them including the controls the control group which was not uh not uh, um not uh, fired at all not it didn't it wasn't fired in the it wasn't it didn't record any magnetic signal in the in the oven and you can see the here you see the y-axis is the is the um magnetic signal uh, the magnetic moment normalized to the initial magnetic moment. So it always starts in one. And as we erase the magnetic field with the rising temperature, the X axis is the temperature, we gradually erase it. So the temperature, the magnetic signal is going down as the temperature is going up. Because this is again with a zero field environment. You can see the not very nice behavior of the unheated bricks, but the heated bricks from 100 degrees, and here I put 220, but the same in 100 degrees, it goes down quickly. And um, and then you have this knee where where the, the the magnetic field is not completely erased, but it's almost completely erased. Where it starts, uh, uh, where this knee. This is a this is our estimation. I won't go into the mathematics here, but we this is how we estimated the ancient heating temperature. So for every one of these, we we estimated the ancient heating temperature, and you can see that the knee is more or less. This one was heated, it recorded the magnetic field in 220 degrees and the magnetic moment was erased a little bit, just uh, uh, one step above 220 is the knee itself. Here, 580, 370. So there's a very good correlation in general between the magnetic, uh, the temperature in which it was recorded and the temperature in which it was erased, which is not surprising, but uh, this hasn't, hasn't been done at least not for these low temperatures. Uh, so. This way we reconstructed the, the, the temperature in which it was heated. Now we, we reconstructed the ancient temperature, but, but it's not really ancient because this is experimental archeology. span We heated it in the lab. So you can see the results here. This is the, the experiment heating temperature, what we did in the lab. And this is the calculated temperature. And you can see very good correlation here. Maybe in the lower temperatures, maybe we're a little bit, uh, we got a, too, it's a little too high and here maybe, too low, but it's we're up to 30 degrees Celsius in average in every temperature step up to 30 degrees off, which is I think a very good uh, uh, 
get very good estimate for the ancient uh, heating temperature. So now we have a tool that can also identify burnt materials from 100 degrees and up uh, with really reliable, I think from about 200 degrees and up between 100 and 200, it's uh, sometimes hard to tell if it was burnt or not, but very reliable from 200 degrees and up and, 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 and can also reconstruct uh, relatively accurately the, the heating temperature. So this is very important. Um, and there, there's, as I said, there's no other tool that deals with these low temperatures um, that does this. But FTIR, I didn't mention this before, FTIR is the great advantage in the higher temperatures. So it, with archaeomagnetism, you cannot say anything about the temperatures when it's more than 600 or 700 degrees. You can only say it was heated to higher temperatures, but you don't know, you can't tell what these temperatures were because of the, the mineralogy of the magnetic uh, carriers. But FTIR sees the, change, the changes in the mineralogy also in those high temperatures. So if you want to estimate temperatures in a, in a wide range from 200 to 1,100 uh, degrees Celsius, you can use for the lower temperatures, you can use archaeomagnetism. And for the higher temperatures, you can use FTIR. So the combination gives us a, a very good uh, uh, tool. Moving on to the second part of my research is the site formation. So we, we wanted to understand when we see a burnt material or material that recorded the magnetic field, we want to understand what happened there. And this is very important, even though I said my research is focused on, on archaeomagnetic dating. But why focus on site formation? Because there's a very big difference if you see a material that recorded the magnetic field. We want to know when this field was recorded. If it's a destruction layer, it's a big difference if it was recorded during the destruction or earlier, maybe during the, the construction of a, of, a, of a building or something like that. So we started in the Givati parking lot in Jerusalem. We reconstructed the magnetic field uh, of Jerusalem in 586 when it was destroyed by the Babylonians. Um, this was published in uh, PLOS One about two years ago. This is the excavation uh, here in the uh, Givati parking lot. What they excavated, they found there this very uh, unique surface um, made of these two uh, uh, layers and so on. And it was, you can see it's collapsed and broken into a few segments and so on. But they weren't sure really what it was. They weren't sure uh, if it uh, was burnt or not, even if it recorded the magnetic field. But we, we just took some samples and, and, measured, and measured them in the lab. And indeed, it recorded the magnetic field. So um, when, they, when they excavated, they found a two meter uh, wide destruction layer full of debris. All you can see it over here. And within this, there were many, many more segments of this surface. You can see one here completely vertical, almost vertical, and one here, uh, a lot of charcoal burnt material around it. You can see here. And um, the, uh, some of them lying on the, on the floor of the bottom story of this uh, monumental building. And you can see one here vertical, many, many of these, uh, uh, of these uh, segments. And I sampled, I, not all of them, they, they, they were probably hundreds of these, but I sampled the bigger and, and the bigger ones. Um, and what I did, I marked before they moved them, when they were still in their original position, which was a collapsed uh, position, I marked lines on them and I measured the, the uh, direction of every line and the, uh, and the orientation of the surface, the, uh, the vertical angle of the surface. And then I removed them, took them to the lab, cut, cut them into little pieces uh, and, and measured the, magnet, the direction of every one of them. And these are the results. So you can see 38 of these segments that I measured gave us directions that are clustered around the north and down. So this, this is an equal area projection. It means here is north, east, and west, and south. And, and, and as you go closer to the center of the circle, it's further down. So um, here, somewhere here is 50 degrees down from the, which is the, very close to the average direction of the magnetic field in Israel. And you can see they didn't, they didn't all give us the same direction. There is some uh, scatter here, but they're all, all of these are clustered around this uh, direction and only four segments gave us completely different directions. Now, why, why are these scattered? Why didn't they give us actually the, the, exactly the direction of the magnetic field during the destruction? Because they, it's a debris, it's a the destruction layer. So there, are, there can be movements, they, they, they collapse, they cool down, they, they cool down after they uh, collapsed. So they, so they recorded more or less the same direction, but then, then each, each of them had slight movements. They, 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 you, there are air, air cavities in there and wood and so on. There can be all kinds of uh, uh, movements, slight movements within this debris layer. 
they were build, uh, later building on this destruction uh, layer. So, so there could be slight movements, and that's why we have this, uh, this scatter over here. And why did these four give us completely different directions? So there are two possibilities. One is that they remained in their original position. They were heated and cooled down in their original position, recorded the magnetic field like all the others, and only later on they collapsed. For some reason, they, they remained in their original position on, and collapsed only after they cooled down. Or another option is that like all the others, they collapsed and then cooled down, but then collapsed again, then moved significantly again. So they resulted in different directions. So this, this is very important for site formation. I, today, I don't think that we can really reconstruct the direction of the magnetic field and use this for dating according to these collapsed materials because it's, it's collapsed. We don't really know if, they're, uh, if it's reliable, even if we do the statistics here. <laughs> but for site formation, this is very, very important. We, 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 the, the archaeologists who excavated here assumed that this was part of the second story and it collapsed during the fire and so on. This is what they assumed, but we proved this with an analytic tool. So what we understand is that this, this structure was actually um, had at least two stories. And this, this uh, surface that we sampled was the, the, a monumental floor of the second surface. And this surface was made uh, on these uh, very massive wooden beams that were found in the excavation when they were charred. And what we understand is that the fire uh, that destroyed this structure dated to 586, not with our method, it was dated by the archeological finds there, but in 586, when the Babylonians burned this structure, the, this, these beams, everything was very hot, including this floor. And these beams at some point failed during the fire and all the second story collapsed into the bottom story. And this is what created the, um, this is when the magnetic recording occurred after they collapsed. Uh, in the in the position, most of them after the uh, in the orientation in which they were uh, on Earth, more or less. Moving on to another uh, example of site formation. This is again in the paper that's now uh, under review. Um, why why is this important for uh, uh, for uh, um, the chronology? I said my I'm focused on chronology. So why does it matter all this site formation? So as I said in Givati, we we tied between the destruction of the structure and the magnetic signal. Otherwise. One could say, well, maybe that floor was recorded the magnetic field when it was made, when it was in its original, when, when people made this floor. So this can be a hundred years earlier than the destruction, but we tied between the destruction event by fire and the magnetic signal. So the same uh, goes for burnt mud bricks. If you find a wall made of, uh, that contains burnt mud bricks, there are three possibilities. One is that these bricks were fired in a kiln prior to construction. And then, uh, and then the magnetic signal is, represents the, the time of construction of the structure and not the destruction. Another possibility is it was fired in C2 during the destruction. And the third most complicated possibility is that it was fired twice, also in a kiln prior to construction and again during the destruction. So, uh, so and this is, these possibilities have a lot to do with the chronology. So it's very important to understand which of these possibilities is, is in fact. So, um, we dealt with a, a, an area ex, of excavation in Tel Safi, published in this paper in 2011, Namda et al. Uh, about, they had the on-site laboratory there and they did a lot of uh, experiments, especially FTIR, to understand uh, this uh, destruction layer. This is the wall that we worked, this is the, the same wall that was uh, studied in uh, Namda et al. and the same, in, uh, I studied that as well. You can see these, uh, these are burnt mud bricks you see them here, but these mud bricks are in situ. You see the, 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 the shape of the brick and so on, this one and this one, and here down below the lower surfaces. This is about the surface of the floor of this. Uh, so it's a few, like three layers up. And, all, and over here, you can see, this is a, um, a collapsed material. So it's not in its original position. This is just a debris that came, fell down from above. All this burnt, burnt material and including this, here it's a very interesting uh, piece because it has this, uh, um, you can see the negative of branches uh, in this. So this is pr probably a part of the roof that collapsed. And, and the, that's why you have the negative of the branches when this, uh, this roof was made on these branches. So the branches are gone, but the negative is still there. So this is, uh, this is very important because even though it's in a very low elevation now, it originated from the roof. And, and the rest of this, all, all this, is also from higher elevation, some maybe from the roof and some 
uh, from maybe the higher parts of the walls, etc. But it's clearly uh, collapsed materials. So I went back to the same the same wall uh, exactly. I think two of the bricks, the, the higher bricks that I showed before, were missing. We probably removed in the during the excavation. But I worked on the lower uh, elevations. These these bricks here. I sampled also these bricks on their outside on both sides and this uh, uh, roof segment and all this uh, collapsed materials originating, as I said, from the roof or the top of the wall, including this piece here, which is probably uh, maybe another roof segment or a brick, but originating for a high elevation because now it's stuck. You can see it's uh, completely vertical here. So it's clearly not in its original position. And I sampled the outside of all of these. And in a few cases, I also cut, you see, I cut this one in half. This is called C, this brick, I called it C, but when I cut it in half, the inside of it, I called it M. I, I sampled the, the inside of it here. You can see here after I removed it, um, it was really, really hard from a very high, hard, high uh, temperature firing. And this brick here, I also cut it in half. You can see I removed one half and, and sampled the, the inside of it all the way through this brick was completely falling apart. It was not hard and not very hard to sample. I used non-magnetic uh, glue to, to help me uh, uh, sample it. And, and you can see the plaster as well. So it was uh, very challenging. And this is because I think it was, if it was fired, uh, it wasn't, wasn't fired to high enough temperatures like these. So it wasn't as hard. So, um, so I sampled the inside of it and this is called Q. Um, so I, I sampled all of this, and these are the direction results. Unlike Givati parking lot where I showed we had a few exceptions, here there were no exceptions at all. All of them, everything I sampled here, the collapsed material, the in-situ material, the, the, the inside of the bricks, everything gave me the same, direct, the same directions, roughly north and down. Again, you see the scatter. The scatter is mainly the, the collapsed material. It gave us uh, directions that are more scattered. And to reconstruct the ancient field, we used only the in situ bricks that are part of the wall. But the um, but the, uh, but but for site formation, it, it's a clear cut here. All all this material was clearly heated and cooled down in the in the orientation in which I sampled it. So the, including the collapsed material. Um, moving on to the temperature. So all the material I sampled here gave us 600 degrees Celsius or more. So it's very high temperatures, everything originating from higher elevations, including this roof segment that was down below, but 600 degrees Celsius. And only these bricks that were down below, this one here that I cut in half, gave me less than 450 degrees Celsius, most of it, they marked here in yellow. And only on one side, on the outer side of one side, we had um, more than 450 degrees Celsius. So this shows that this brick was actually, um, like all the others, it was heated in C2, uh, uh, but, it, but it wasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, heated to high, hot enough temperatures to make it really consolidated, but only to 450 degrees. I think this is because the elevation. Igor uh, Kremerman and Rucha Hagros showed that when you, when you burn, burn a structure, the temperatures are very, very different. When you, on the higher elevations, you can get to more than 600 degrees where the floor can be less than 200. So here, this brick is not on the floor, but it's a slightly higher than the floor, but not, um, but not on the floor. So uh, that's why I think it, this explains the relatively low temperatures. Now this, this brick could not, in my understanding, it could not be pre-fired in a kiln because if it would be pre-fired in a kiln, it would be fired to 600 degrees or more hot enough temperatures to really make it consolidated because that's why you fire it in a kiln to begin with. And it wasn't hard as I said at all. So it doesn't seem that it could be fired in a kiln and, and it was fired only once during the destruction of this uh, structure. So this gave, gave us, we got to these conclusions from this case study <laughs> that the fire occurred within the studied uh, structure. The previous paper suggested that there was fire in the vicinity but not in the structure itself. I think that we showed because there's no other way to explain the the bricks, the in situ bricks that were fired and recorded the magnetic field, the structure collapsed during the destruction event, at least the, the area that we sampled, because also the collapsed materials uh, uh, recorded the magnetic field after their, their, uh, they collapsed in the, in, more or less in the position in which we measured them uh, and not over a period of decades as was uh, suggested before. And the, the structure was built using sun dried bricks, not um, not pre-fired bricks, as was suggested. Now, pre-firing bricks uh, prior to the Roman period was suggested in the Namda paper uh, and in uh, several other papers recently. 
And uh, I, I personally think that uh, it still needs uh, to be reevaluated because um, in order, uh, I'll be convinced that the, that the wall was built of pre-fired bricks if we, we sample the different bricks and every brick would give us a completely different direction. Uh, uh, one will point that way and one point that way, not north and not down. But if all the bricks give us more or less the same direction, it, does, it doesn't seem likely that they were pre-fired. We showed it here. We showed it uh, also in another uh, published, uh, um, another publication that they claimed that it was made of pre-fired bricks. Also there we showed it, it's, it, has, it hasn't been published yet, but uh, um, but I think it should be reevaluated in general. Now, the combination of the, uh, able, the ability to identify firing also in low temperatures and high temperatures and the directional analysis, the, this combination is a very powerful tool when you wanna understand the destruction layers. So moving to the most important and the main part of my uh, talk, of my research, but is the archaeomagnetic dating. But as I said, the, the experimental archaeology, understanding how, how magnetic, how archaeological materials record the magnetic field and the site formation, understanding when this uh, recording occurred is very important for the dating. That's why we, we talked about all, all that before. So this, the archaeomagnetic dating was published in the recently in the PNAS, as I, uh, as Tzila mentioned. Um, well, I, I think in this room, I probably don't need to talk about the Iron Age chronology debate. Everybody, I'm sure all of you heard, have heard of this. We have these, uh, on the one hand, we have these military campaigns. We know from historical sources that we had uh, these campaigns probably, at least most of them uh, uh, occur. And we have these destruction layers on the one hand found in archaeology. The, the destruction layers are the most important uh, for, uh, for the chronology. They're the skeleton of the entire uh, chronology. Um, but um, we don't always know to, to connect between a certain destruction layer and a historical de destruction event. And, and this is one of the reasons for the Iron Age chronology debate uh, that uh, started in 1996, but it's actually still going on today. I think these two papers in NEA more or less uh, represent the, the situation today. So uh, probably the gap is somewhat narrower, uh, narrower now, but still there is a gap between the two uh, uh, opinions. and. The, the problem is even much bigger during the Hallstatt Plateau. So between 800 and 400 BCE, radiocarbon is, is not very useful. Because it's not, it doesn't enable high resolution dating. There are some uh, people, there, there is some work trying to improve this, but at the moment, uh, radiocarbon is not very useful. And usually uh, excavations in these periods don't even uh, send samples to, to be dated. And, and during this period, uh, the radiocarbon is very limited and, and archaeomagnetism, I think, can be part of the solution. So the good news is that we uh, also during this, mainly during this period, we have these chronological anchors, these sites that everybody agrees that were destroyed during a certain period. Yes, I mentioned a few of them here. Uh, these are, I worked on all of these. Uh, Ashkelon, of course, is missing. Uh, I didn't manage to get uh, samples from Ashkelon, but uh, and these are sites that we know from historical sources on the one hand and uh, archeology span on the other hand, that they were destroyed and burnt during a certain uh, military campaign. The, maybe the best example is Lachish, Statum III, which was destroyed uh, by the Assyrians in 701, uh, uh, as depicted in the famous uh, relief. So these anchors are, are often used for the, for the uh, pottery. You take the pottery of Lachish 3, 701, you find another site with the same pottery. You say, well, this also was destroyed at 701. But it's, we know that the pottery has its problems and uh, the, the time that pottery changes is debated and so on. So uh, here we have a, an analytic tool to try to correlate between these chronological anchors and other sites presumably destroyed at the same uh, time. What we did, we sampled uh, 21 destruction layers in 18 archaeological sites. This is maybe my favorite uh, mud brick wall, uh, at least the one published in, uh, in this paper. Um, there's a nice, very nice wall in Megiddo uh, that looks as, as good. You have this, uh, uh, the stone foundation here and the mud brick superstructure. This is in Tel Batash, uh, excavated uh, about uh, 40 years ago. And still these mud bricks were fired to such a high temperature that they're perfectly preserved. Uh, and the, the, you can see that they're in their original position. In these cases, we reconstruct both direction and intensity. In other cases where it's collapsed materials, we reconstruct only intensity. We, we also work in the direction, but not for dating. We don't try to use the direction for dating. We use the direction only for site formation, as I explained before. 
Now we combine these results with uh, um, the results from uh, pottery from Tel Megiddo. These are two papers that were published uh, back to back. Um, why, why did we use Tel Megiddo? Because we had uh, 23 different contexts, 18 layers. So you have the stratigraphy of the pottery. So you, we, we can use this for the model and say, this is earlier and this is later according to the stratigraphy and a lot of radiocarbon dates. So we have this, this skeleton of dates of, of, uh, of um, Tel Megiddo. And then we can take this data and, and use it for reconstructing. These are all the red points you can see here, yes? From the earliest points here, and all, this is the this is the intensity of the field. I'm talking here pottery, so we have intensity only. This is the intensity of the field here, and the dates here. You can see the different strata in Tel Megiddo. Um, that you can see the areas here and the and the stratigraphy here of the different uh, strata. So you, you see the, the the results here. Uh, the red results are the the all the results from Tel Megiddo. And zoom in here on the end of the late bronze and the Iron Age. You can see the combination of this with previous data like the blue uh, that comes from Timna, um, from slag, copper slag, and, and the green, which is the, the destruction uh, layers that I, in, that I uh, studied. So these are the results from the destruction layers. Um, you can see here um, the, the intensity here, as I explained before, uh, the, the different uh, destruction events are marked by different colors. And um, you can see the changes in the magnetic field. The light green line is the, the model, the Bayesian model we use uh, uh, tries to predict the behavior of the magnetic field according to the different uh, data. We have here not only the destruction events, but as I mentioned, also the data from Megiddo and also previous excavations in Israel and also in Syria. The, the diamonds here, if you can see, the diamonds represent data from Syria because it's close enough so we can use that data as well. We have good correlation with, uh, with the data from Syria by a French group that we uh, work a lot with. And um, the direction, declination here and inclination here, again, only parts, not all the points, the colored points you have here appear here as well because we don't always have uh, direction. Sometimes we have only intensity. And this enabled us to, to um, look at the re reconstruction of the different military campaigns um, and, and, and correlate between sites that were presumably destroyed during a specific military campaign. And usually in most cases, as you can see here, like the green points here and others, we have a good correlation between sites that were presumably destroyed during a certain military campaign. Now, there are a lot of chronological conclusions that, that we mentioned in the paper. I don't have time to go into all of them now. So I'll focus only on uh, two examples, one that was published in this paper and one that's uh, unpublished. The one that we published in this paper is Stratum S1A in Tel Beit Sheaan. You can see again the, the stone foundation and the mud brick superstructure. This is just one of these structures. They, they found four monumental uh, structures in, in this uh, stratum S1A. It was they're clearly destroyed by fire. And they had a very, very rich ceramic assemblage, which is uh, late iron 2A. Um, but the, the problem is that for uh, absolute dating, uh, we didn't have uh, radiocarbon uh, that could help us to, uh, uh, date the destruction of these structures. They did take two radiocarbon uh, samples and they were, they were published in the past, but they were taken from wooden beams that were used to construct these uh, structures. So uh, of, wooden beams, of course, don't, they, they only give us the date of the, of the construction. And of course, there's the old wood effect. So of course, they, these both of them gave us completely different results. Like I think about uh, 200 years difference between the two samples. So one of them has the old wood effect, maybe also the other one has some old wood effect. And in, and in any case, the it doesn't help, really help us to, to uh, date the destruction. So we're left with the relative chronology, which is late iron 2A. So what do we do? So Ami Mazal, when he published the final report, he said, well, I don't really know when this was destroyed. And he gave two uh, possibilities that are almost a uh, hundred years different. One is that it occurred in the late ninth century BC, but in may maybe by Hazael, king of Aram Damascus. And one that it was in the late 10th or early ninth century and suggested maybe uh, it was uh, destroyed by Shoshank, uh, a biblical Shisha. Uh, but, but he couldn't uh, uh, conclude which of the two possibilities is more likely. And then um, in, in, when he excavated Tel Rehov, in Tel Rehov, he found two, uh, two uh, stratified um, strata, also with the same pottery exactly, late iron 2A, Rehov 4, 
and Rehov 5. Rehov 4, the final destruction of Tel Rehov, the huge uh, destruction of the entire site. And Rehov 5, uh, 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 destruction only of the, uh, the area of the beehives, the apiary, uh, the unique apiary that was excavated there, the apiary itself made of mud and was burnt. So, so when he when he published the report of Tel Rehov, he, um, he went back and, and also uh, wrote about Beit Sheehan, again, saying there are these two options, but he preferred the, the later option, the, it goes with the Chof 4 in the late 9th century BCE. But again, this is just uh, an assumption because he couldn't prove it because the pottery is the same pottery and, uh, and, the, and there was no radiocarbon to, to help. When we look at our results, we get a completely different picture. Here you see the direction results. So this is Beit Sheehan here. Uh, this is inclination and declination. This is not a very big difference, but still a, a difference. This, this is the... Uh, date in the inclination declination here and this is the equal equ area projection assuming the equal area projection yes this is north so we has we have positive declination to the east in both of them but you can see the declination in, in these three sites is bigger than Beit Sheehan and the inclination is significantly higher it's uh, yes it's more than 60 degrees down and this is just uh, 50 about 55 there is a significant difference here. Here we're not talking only about Beit Sheehan and Khofor, but we have two other sites. We have Gat Tel uh, the, the famous destruction uh, that is also historically dated. So we have just a perfect match between Khofor and Tel Esafi Gat. It was that they were claimed to be destroyed during both by Hazael. You get exactly the same direction, and also Tevet Five, Chova uh, Tevet. Um, we have uh, exactly the same direction. You see also uh, inclination and also declination, just a perfect match of these three sites that were presumably destroyed by Hazael. And Beit Sheehan is, is uh, somewhat uh, different. Moving on to the intensity, here it's even a clearer uh, picture. You see again, Beit Sheehan is down here, the much lower intensity, then uh, Rehov 4, Gat, Tevet, and here we have also Tel Zayt, where we didn't have direction results, but we had only intensity. But again, a good agreement between Tel Zayt 13, which is also attributed to Hazael. All these agree with each other, but don't agree with these three. Here we have uh, Beit Sheehan, Rehov 5, the apiary. As I said, we didn't have anything in situ, so we didn't have directions, but we had intensity. Just the beehive themselves that were burnt. And Tevet uh, 7. In Tevet, again, they had, also in Chovat Tevet, they had two stratified uh, destruction layers, the VET5, the later one, and the VET7, the earlier one, both iron, late iron 2A pottery. And you see the difference in the, in the intensity. Um, now, as I explained, the Bayesian model creates this green line that predicts the, 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 the changes in the magnetic field with the error bar. And the error bar is sometimes smaller and sometimes bigger, depending on the, on the data that we have for that period. So this enables us to, to, to date our, uh, our, these finds. This is actually a, a brand new dating tool that we introduced for this period. Now, you can see, um, for example, every date, every datum here has two things. It has its, uh, the, the date, the age range, which we, which we give according to the uh, radiocarbon, the pottery, the, the stratigraphy, et cetera and uh, the, the magnetic intensity. Here it's intensity only. Now, um, for example, if we look at Beit Sheehan, you can see that we gave Beit Sheehan a very, very large age range. Why did we do this? Since we didn't have any, any other, uh, no radiocarbon, so we were only, uh, only the pottery, and we, we took the, every opinion, the low chronology, the high chronology, everybody will agree that the date of Beit Sheehan is somewhere in, in this. Uh, so we took the widest, uh, the, uh, Race that we could, that, that everybody agrees that the, the date in Beit, Beit Sheehan is some, somewhere in there. In Chol 5, since we have radiocarbon, we took a much smaller uh, age range, et cetera, and, and the same for all the other sites. And, and the, the, um, the Bayesian model checks and sees the, where, where it agrees and where it doesn't agree with the others. So you can see Beit Sheehan, its intensity is here. If we, if we would move the, Beit, the date of Beit Sheehan here, it would be way out of the curve. So this is very unlikely that Beit Sheehan is contemporary with these sites here. So this enables one of the outcomes of, the, of our um, Bayesian model is a, is a date. Um, so here you can see the probability density, and this is the, the age. So it starts with the, just the range, the age range that we gave, the 940 to 820 BCE. This age range, the gray uh, rectangle here, it's, it's the 
if the prior uh, probability we said any date within this age range is is uh, is possible uh, and there is no no, uh, no difference between any date anything here is uh, is okay but the, the magnetic intensity points to much earlier dates are much more probable because of the big difference in the magnetic field and the agreement between the earlier ones and the later ones so it points clearly to an earlier date um, now um it's very hard to say who destroyed these uh, Tel Rehov 5 and Tevet 7. We don't, because we don't have any chronological anchor. We don't have one site like we have uh, uh, Tel Esafi, which we know was destroyed by Hazael or, or uh, Lachish 3701, sites that we know when they were destroyed. We don't have such an example for uh, Shishak or any, any uh, early destruction here in the late 10th or early 9th century. So we can only um, assume here and one assumption that we, we suggested is that it was destroyed by Shishak. Now, there's a lot of debate about Shishak, if this campaign indeed happened, but who knows if he actually destroyed sites. Many, many people think that he didn't destroy any sites. He just came and you know, got the taxes and left. He didn't bother to destroy any site. But, but these, this is the, the famous relief in Karnak, founding Karnak in Egypt, where it depicts the, the pharaoh himself, uh, Shishak, and the different sites that he conquered are depicted here by prisoners of war. You know, they have the, their hands tied behind their back. And, and on every, every prisoner here, it says the name of a place that he claims that he conquered. Now, two of these places are, that are side by side, uh, probably for geographical uh, reasons, are Re Rehov and Beit She'an. So he says, I conquered Rehov and I conquered Beit She'an, maybe. Who knows, maybe the Rehov could be this uh, Rehov 5, the, the stratum with the apiary and Beit She'an. The, as I said, it's very debated. So I'm just uh, put, uh, raising the possibility. It's very, very hard to conclude. Moving on to uh, the last uh, example of archaeomagnetic dating. Uh, this, this is brand new. Nobody, uh, I haven't presented this yet in any, uh, in, in, you're the first to hear this. Um, this is uh, the destruction of Lachish at 701. This is from Yadin's book, uh, published in 1963. Uh, you can see in Tel Lachish, the, the, the artist that made this uh, showed two, two walls, the inner wall of the city up on top and somewhat down in the uh, slope, in the middle of the slope, another wall. It's also protected by, uh, there are many problems with this uh, reconstruction, but I just wanted to show the, the this is the common, uh, the common understanding that Lachish was protected during 701. The, the, the Assyrian campaign in 701 was protected by two different walls. Um, this is from Usishkin's book. Uh, you can see again the, the, the top, the, the wall on the top with the towers and also the mid slope wall called uh, Usishkin and also following Stalky and then excavated there in the 1930s. They call this the revetment wall, the outer revetment wall. And uh, recently, Gaufinkel, who excavated the, the, this site, but in the uh, north of the, uh, in the northeastern corner of the site, he suggested that this wall was actually an MB, uh, MB wall built in the MB2B. And uh, there's a series of uh, papers, I put only some of them here, uh, that uh, uh, Gaufinkel on one hand and Sishkin on the other hand are uh, arguing about the date of this, uh, of this wall. Uh, other walls is, uh, included, but uh, I'm interested in this wall. The, this wall was excavated by Stalky, as I said, in the 1930s, all the way around. And only here, there's a very small gap, but this, this is the wall, the outside wall, the inner wall marked here. Uh, this is the inner inside wall that everybody agrees it's made of mud brick and it's, it was destroyed at 701. Uh, but the, the outside wall, uh, the revetment wall is this one here. And I sampled it here in this uh, in this corner. Now this this wall was uh, Stalky um, excavated the outside of this wall all the way around in, in the 1930s. So it's clearly one one uh, one wall going all the way around. But the date is very problematic. Stalky excavated only on the outside. So uh, uh, and and so did Osishkin. So Garfinkel says, well, from when you excavate a wall from the outside, it's hard to date it. You need to, to, to date it, you need to sample from the inside and find a, a floor that's abutting the, the wall. This is again, the same wall from the, this is uh, Osish, uh, Osishkin's uh, area R uh, here, uh, that was supervised by Yuda Dagan. 
And here you can see it in the cut. This is this is the the, uh, the this tower. There's a, a tower in the wall, but this tower is made mainly of mud brick. It probably has a, a stone foundation, but most of it is made of of uh, mud brick. And it was covered at some point by the Assyrian siege ramp. This is the Assyrian the Assyrian siege ramp. Two different possibilities ra raised by uh, Ossetian, and even a, a third possibility, much longer, suggested by uh, Galfinkel. But is if if uh, Osishkin is right, this was in use in 701, constructed in the Iron Age. And if Galfinkel was right, this wall was already, if it's part of the of the same outer revetment wall, then maybe it was constructed in the middle bronze. You can see it here in the excavation of uh, Osishkin. This is the wall I sampled here. Um, in the and this is the Assyrian siege ramp, the cut they made in the Assyrian, Assyrian siege ramp. And originally it was much higher probably the siege ramp, and it actually covered. The, this wall, so it couldn't be later than 701. But and this is the line of the of the wall, the revetment wall. It's it's usually in the mid slope, but here it goes up relatively higher up in the slope and connects to this tower and then goes down again to the area of, of the gate of the site. So this is this is uh, the picture taken in uh, during the uh, excavations of Osishkin. You can see it here. Here down below are many uh, things left from the fire. And, uh, and uh, many hundreds of arrowheads, etc. And here, these bricks were, fi were clearly fired. They were red. Uh, Yuta Dagan, the, the area supervisor, suggested that these were uh, fired in a kiln. Again, fired in a kiln used for construction because this was the weakest part of the of the of, of the Lachish of the fortifications. Then they really wanted to pr protect this area, so they fired the the bricks specifically in this area uh, prior to uh, construction. Um, I, I sampled them again with the same method. I created flat surfaces and I um, measured the orientation, cut them in the lab. And these are the direction results. Again, all clustered to the north and down, clearly not fired uh, in a kiln, clearly fired in situ. Um, and you can see there is some difference between the different bricks since the, this is exposed since uh, the 1930s, as I said, and it's, uh, uh, and some of the bricks weren't uh, uh, clearly in the original position. So there can be slight differences. This is the direction that we measured from Lachish 3, from the gate area. There they, we found in situ bricks on the, on the gate itself. So the, I think the direction there is more reliable, but still you can see a uh, pretty good agreement. And moving to the intensity, this is a clear cut. So this is the intensity here in the middle bronze. When Dolphinkel suggested that this wall was built, the intensity is like is somewhere down here, similar to today's field, by the way, about, about 80 here. And, this is the middle bronze, as I said, including the points from Megiddo that we have from the ceramics, etc. It all points to a very weak magnetic field. Now, Lachish LC08, the wall that I sampled, the intensity is the blue area here, yes, with the arrow bar, yes. So I put it, and, and all, all this uh, date is possible to begin with, but you see that there is no way this wall could be burnt in the middle bronze. It has to be Iron Age. It agrees with the three, if we zoom in here, up on top, you can see, so it can be that we have a peak. We have actually four peaks during the Iron Age of the magnetic field. One in the 11th century, 9th century, 8th century, and 7th century, or around 600. Now it can't be 600 because it was covered by the Assyrian siege ramp. And I think it's very clear also from the archaeology there and the finds below the wall that this wall was burnt during, at seven, in 701 BCE. This is the intensity of 701 in Lachish, in the, in the gate area. You see a good agreement. This is, LC08 is maybe, it seems to slightly uh, even higher magnetic field than, than, than in the gate area, but the, 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 there is an overlap of the error bars, so there's no problem. It's very good correlation with uh, 701 BCE. Now, another uh, possibility we needed to, to rule out is that it was burnt, and that this wall was burnt by Usishkin, because uh, every, every year, uh, it, it happened by accident that some uh, worker brought a cigarette and the, and the entire site went, went on fire. And later on, they, they did it intentionally every season because they found that it's much easier to walk around the site and, and see the, 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 see everything on the surface without all this uh, vegetation that disturbs. So every summer they would, they would burn the site. This is from Musishkin's book. Um, this is, of course, not a very good practice when you think of archaeomagnetism, but uh, but but you see today's this couldn't be today's field. It's it's more than two times stronger. The the magnetic uh, recording is more than two times stronger 
uh, in 701 than today's field. So there's no way that this could uh, be the effect. And uh, Osishkin told me that no, I shouldn't worry. They didn't burn the excavation areas, only around. So um, <clears throat> this is, now who burned this wall? This is the last thing. Uh, who burned the wall? I, I won't, don't have time to go into this, but I think there are two possibilities. One is that the, the defenders of Lachish uh, through uh, burning materials, you can see here in the in the relief, they threw uh, torches and maybe even uh, wood. Uh, Starkey, uh, Olga Tafnel writes about uh, uh, wood that was found burnt around this uh, revetment pole. So maybe they uh, threw burning materials and to try to uh, create a fire and to prevent from the, the the siege machines, the Syrian siege machines, to approach the city walls. This is one possibility. You see, they're throwing these uh, torches, and here there's a Syrian soldier that's throwing water to try to put the fire out to prevent the Syrian siege machine from getting on fire. This is one possibility, but since it was fired to a very high elevation in the wall and to very high temperatures, I didn't mention this, like 600 degrees Celsius or more, I think that another possibility should be uh, um, thought, maybe, maybe the Syrians did this intentionally. Maybe they put, they, they, while they were building the siege ramp, they needed, they, they, they wanted the, the defenders of the city not to disturb them, not to throw things at them and shoot arrows, etc. So if they, they burn a very high, very strong fire down below here, this fire can maybe uh, affect the, you know, the, the, the balconies that probably maybe had some wood balconies up here. Or, and even without that, just the smoke going up, because this is, the, the, as I said, the, the southwestern corner. So the, the, the wind, which is usually to the west, in, in, in general in Israel, in Lachish area specifically, it's usually coming from the west. So the, the smoke would go uh, and, and disturb the, the defense of the, the city. And this would be in favor of the Assyrians and enable them to go on building their, uh, their, their siege ramp. And, and until at some point it was covered by the siege ramp. And then after, after it was covered, of course, it couldn't be burned. Uh, an example of an Assyrian soldier burning, using fire to burn uh, this is from the uh, Assyrian siege against Thebes in Egypt. So you can see this soldier, he has a shield. He's defending himself from things that can be thrown out from above. And he's holding a torch to, to, to set fire on the, on the city. And uh, also in the Bible, we have a parallel. Yes, so it, uh, Avimelech that came twice. In two cases, he came to the tower and fought against it and drew near to the door of the tower to burn it with fire. Yes, so he, you know, he tells all these soldiers to bring all these people to bring wood and, and set a big fire to. So the use of fire during a siege is, is uh, used also, uh, known also from the Bible. One, just a short comment about future potential. So we can, we can use this method for anything. Uh, also earlier periods, yes, the earlier Iron Age destruction layers, I already have data from uh, many sites, uh, including uh, Megiddo and the Teldo and and many other sites, it's a bigger database than what was published now in PNAS, which I'm working on uh, to publish uh, soon. And other periods, this can be used also for prehistory, any period from when people started using fire, it has been used also for uh, understanding fire of, uh, of uh, ceramics and way before ceramics uh, with flint, etc. cetera. Any, any use of fire can be uh, reconstructed and dated using this method. And uh, any burnt materials, ceramics, uh, uh, taboons, kilns, these are, this is a taboon that I sampled just last Friday in Tel Megiddo. And uh, uh, a taboon, you get a very good, if it's preserved perfectly like this one here, then you have, you can get direction and intensity form. So it's really uh, great. And, and any, any ceramics, uh, also past excavations, like I showed in Tel Bechan, we can do that. Uh, we, can, we can go back and, and, and date. Uh, previous excavations where we don't have radiocarbon, we can date the pottery using this uh, method. And maybe later in the comments, if you have any other ideas, I'll be very happy to, to hear. To, to summarize the, the talk, um, we, we, after uh, the, the chronology debate started with uh, only with uh, you know, the stratigraphy and the ceramics, and for two decades now, it's been focused on radiocarbon. So I think we presented a new uh, high resolution dating method, which is very useful. It's an adi a good addition, I think, to radiocarbon in the earlier periods, and it's unique in the ability to, uh, recon to, to date in high resolution in the later periods. Um, I, ex I showed how, why the site formation is so important, also in itself, but also for the dating, to understand when the, the magnetic data, when it comes from. Uh, and, and we have here a real uh, high, high resolution reconstruction of the magnetic field because we use 
the very good dating of archaeological materials if it's based on historical sources, the, the chronological anchors, and the radiocarbon, as I showed in the case of Megiddo. So the, the, the good combination of the his, history, archaeology, and the, radio, and the magnetic field is, uh, resulted in a, very, in a brand new uh, dating method. Now, this period that I talked about is very interesting also because the biblical uh, campaigns and all the, the chronology uh, debate. And also, what I didn't talk about so much, but there is a the, during this period, the magnetic field was very, very uh, strange. It's what we call the Levantine Iron Age anomaly. As I showed, more than two times stronger than today's field with these peaks going up and down. This is very, very interesting for geophysicists. As I said before, geophysicists have no other method to reconstruct in this resolution. Yes, sometimes we can show the difference between 604 and 586 destruction. So the, the changes in such a resolution, there's no way they can do it in any. So, so there are now geophysicists working on, the, on this database to try and better understand the magnetic field of the Earth. And, and uh, um, as I said, for in the future, this can be used for any and many kinds of materials, burnt, burnt materials from any archaeological uh, uh, period, from prehistory all the way down. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. I want to ask if only some are in the same size or measure or weight. So for um for direction, I need relatively bigger size samples because I need the orientation. So it's hard to measure the orientation for something very small. So you need uh, you need a significant. Um, it depends if it's a if it's a, a taboon or a kiln that's going to be destroyed anyhow. So I can take samples like this big. But if not, I can I can ma manage with uh, like two or three centimeters is enough for for direction for intensity. I can I already worked on materials on boule and things like that. That I take a very very small piece of the or uh, you know um, um, things from museums. Uh, uh, ceramic vessels from museums and stuff, I take much smaller uh, vessels. In the second one, uh, you showed the one with the wall, the big uh, stone. Yes. Uh, the stone foundation. It's possible that in the second, even in the one, the small. Yes. They use it as a special fuel. They brought it because it's on the upper side, you say it's flat uh, grid. Yes. And underneath, you have stone. So it might uh, be used twice. The, the bricks might be used yes. secondary use? Well, the stone. Oh, the stones. Uh, first so time. Uh, earlier, also, who was that something? So the, the stones. Could originally be used in a different, but I didn't work on the stones at all. I work only on the mud bricks. The stones don't aren't a good recorder of the magnetic field, so it's hard. If you had a fire in the earliest uh, place, oh yeah, what will happen in the second place? I see. So if uh, if I understand the question, so these mud bricks could have you were suggesting that these mud bricks were fired during a, a, a oh, and so. If the stones were fired or not, it doesn't doesn't matter for me. I I can't tell. Uh, the electric uh, direction. The the magnetic. Uh, we, we don't. The, it depends what stones, but in general, the, the main stone used in the, the uh, we don't. They don't. They're not a good recorder in Israel. They're not a good recorder. Basalt rock are good recorders, but they're problematic because they have a very strong magnetic signal to begin with. Yeah, basalt. The basalt I said, basalt is, is has a very strong magnetic signal, but it, its magnetic signal was recorded when when during the, the eruption of the volcano. So we don't uh, we, we we it's problematic so for us. On the from, uh, maybe we can give. Yeah, you, you want to ask? Yes. Thank you for the point. Very interesting. I have a more general question about the implications for the geophysics, which I know nothing about. The fluctuations, the very bad fluctuations in the color magnetic field, which can be called with very high resolution. What do they mean? Do they, do they have a correlation with global climate changes? 
Uh, it's a very good question and it's uh, debated. There, there are papers claiming that uh, the changes in the magnetic field influence the climate and uh, it influences, as I said, it also influences the, the magnetic, the, the particles coming from the sun and the aurora and so on. So the radiocarbon, yes, the, 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 the amount of radiocarbon in the atmosphere and so on, is it related to the intensity of the field or not? And the, 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 the climate, is climate change related to the magnetic field? It's, uh, there are papers that claim it, but it's not, it's, it's debating. This kind of Yes, I wrote a proposal suggesting that. <laughs> yes. Thank you for your explanation. Can you please elaborate on um, how, what, what exactly particles could seem of the working with the material to understand the intensity of the direction of what on the physical level, the chemical level? We um, if, if I understood correctly, otherwise correct me, I think uh, we use ferromagnetic minerals. We don't need all the, all the minerals to be ferromagnetic. It's enough to have a very small uh, proportion uh, in the material. And the main, the main magnetic carrier is magnetite, but, uh, but also other materials, sometimes hematite and sometimes lower uh, other uh, materials. And, this, and the different, the different uh, uh, minerals have a different blocking temperature. This is why when we erase the magnetic field, we don't erase it at once, but we gradually erase it in the different temperatures because we have different minerals that record it in different temperatures. This is, if we had only magnetite, we could only record fire from 580 degrees and up, which is the K temperature of the magnetite. But here we have, uh, we, we can see already from 100 degrees, we have a recording. So there's a whole, whole group of uh, ferromagnetic minerals in there. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so we're talking about some uh, museum artifacts, um, for example, Fayence. Could be a good candidate for this, although I understand that it's a very destructive uh, method and it would need a big sample size. Um, for Fayence, uh, I, I, we ha I, I don't know if it, it's been tried, if somebody tried to do this. Um, in general, glass, the, 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 the ingredients of glass would probably not be good magnetic recorders. But as I said, there are sometimes surprises because you don't need the, all the material to be ferromagnetic. You need only a small proportion. So if in faience, the, the, you have some, some um, ferromagnetic minerals, then in theory, it could work. And uh, regarding the, um, I'm, I'm working on a method that's non-destructive for Apollo intensity. There are, there are things we can check. I, I worked on hundreds of boule, uh, which I didn't uh, do, I didn't des destroy them. I got the boule, I measured them and I returned them to the IA, but I measured only the magnetic moment as they are and susceptibility, all kinds of measurements that aren't destructive, but we can't date it. You, to use it for actual dating, we, we, at the moment it is destructive and I'm working on a non-destructive method. I hope it works. But for very, I'm talking about very small samples that we can measure the entire, like you say, a fiance, uh, some something made of fiance that we can measure the entire thing, do the experiment, and then and then return it. We will, uh, it will go through a lot of experiments, maybe heating and cooling, but not, uh, but not. We don't have to cut off a piece. Hopefully, yes. Well, yes. And especially before we have the uh, recordings from satellites nowadays, now we're talking about past. So, can we use any mathematical models to predict uh, the magnetic field of the Earth before? Or we rely only on the data that we found on the sites with the clear days in the past? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. We, there are geophysicists that we work with them that are building uh, mathematical models to try to. Uh, uh, understand the behavior of the field, but the, the behavior of the magnetic field is very, uh, it's hard to predict it because in the past, as I said, there were reversals, but these reversals are not uh, in, in specific times. They can be 20 million years between reversals and they can be 20,000 years between reversals. So it's, it, and also the behavior of the direction intensity, as I said, Today, the magnetic field is going down all the time. So some people say, well, maybe we're, we're on our way to a reversal or maybe the, it's, it's, uh, there'll be no magnetic field. On the other hand, we see that it went up and down, but also 
the, what you saw, the way uh, what I saw in the Iron Age, where it went up and down and up and down again into so strong, uh, like more than twice of today's field. When this was first found, geophysicists said that according to their models, it couldn't be. There is no way it would happen. But we see more and more data from many, many sites in Israel and uh, they also from Cyprus and other sites. So uh, today it's uh, it's very uh, much accept accepted that the magnetic field behave like this, but there's no way to predict this by a mathematical model if you don't have the data. This is why our research is so important for the for building these day, these uh, models. Any other questions? Yes? So our model is based only on the data that we found. Uh, so could it be the case that, for example, for now on, you know, this uh, range of density is you know, from A to B, and later we'll have a new batch of data so that would show that in this particular period the density will be wider, and we have to evaluate it over uh, data. Can we have later more data that would show different density? Yes, the, the the model that I presented here is not final. We add this is it's it's uh, the more data we add to it, it will be more accurate and more reliable. We add more and more data points, and we every, every time we run the model again. So the dating here is based on the, all the data we put into it. And if in the future we have more data, it will be more reliable. This is what the the tabun I just sampled in uh, in Tel in Tel Megiddo. I, I sampled taboons in the 7th century BC. Why, why am I so interested in the 7th century? Because we have a destruction at 701. We have a destruction at 600, let's say about 600 with a Babylonian, the early Babylonian campaigns. But the 7th century, is, we don't have any destruction layers. So the dating there is much more problematic. So if I have stratified uh, uh, um, locuses from, from Megiddo with uh, taboons and pottery, I can combine this to to better reconstruct the magnetic field during the seventh century. So I'll add this data and then I'll have a better, today we know there was a minimum sometime in the seventh century, but it's not, you see, there is not, not a lot of data points that this is rely, uh, relied on. If we add more data points in the seventh century, it would be more reliable. So we'll run the model again. I hope I answered you, but if you have, if you have specific questions, I'll, I'm here and I'll be happy to answer anything. And I don't know if everybody's interested in all those details. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, in the chat, to check in the chat. Still mm -hmm. No okay, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Yeah. Thank you.